everybody. Um, uh, I guess they've done an introduction. I really have no idea if you know who I am or not. I'm a counselor in South Louisiana, and um, just want to share just a few tips for you today. Hopefully, we can spend most of our time answering questions about um, how to accompany teens while social distancing. Um, you know, mainly, you know, for parents, you know, as well as for youth leaders. I, I think my, um, a couple of big points that, that I think are really important. One is resilience is a very, very popular buzzword in ministry and in psychological circles right now. And we have talked for years about how to um, talk to young people and how to teach them how to be resilient. Well, God just delivered it right up for us. It's, it's here. Um, you know, talking versus communicating. And, and what we say to them right now is much, much less important and effective than what we're modeling for them. So we are giving them the best lesson in their lives and perhaps even in our lives on being resilient. And so what are we being resilient to? And I think this is important, and I, you, you can expect to be hearing this in the next few days, um, is that so what we're experiencing is, 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 is trauma. And I think that is, um, that's an appropriate word, just based on my clinical experience, we're experiencing cultural trauma, and we're going to see some of the stages of that and some of those stages of grief. And, and right now, I think everyone is still in shock. It's one of the many sociological reasons we're seeing a lack of compliance with some of the directives is that folks just haven't really wrapped their mind around the fact that it's real. And so trauma is an incredibly um, distressing um, event, series of events, or situation, and this is a prolonged situation, that, that overwhelms sometimes the, the physical nervous system, uh, the central nervous system, the body, um, as well as the soul. And so that's, that is something that we're going through. What I'm seeing is that adults are struggling with the trauma more than the teens are. The teens are, and, and some of them are. I'm not saying that teens aren't, aren't struggling and that young people aren't because they are. Um, but I'll tell you, the two adults in my house are struggling a lot more than the two teenagers are um, in my house. And so the best thing that we can do for young people in terms of accompanying them right now is to take care of ourselves. If it's good for you, then it's going to be good for your teens. And so what does that mean? If that means you've got to sleep in to take care of your body, if it means you've got to get up early so that you can go get your workout in, if it means that you need to carve some time out of the day to pray, if you need to lock yourself in the bathroom or a closet and that becomes your little chapel, whatever it is you need to do to take care of you. And we'll talk about some real practical things here in a second. But if it's not good for you, it's not going to be good for your team, your teenager and your young person. This is not the time. This is not the time to embrace the martyr mentality. Well, I'm just going to lay it all out there because you. this is not going on for days. This situation in our country right now is not going on for weeks. Wrap your mind around this situation going on for months and come up with a plan of action that you can sustain over months. And that's going to involve perhaps like us, like reorganizing your house, setting up desks, figuring out a bunch of different things, coming up with exercise schedules. And we'll talk more about exercise in a second. Um, so take care of yourself. Um, next would be you can't get to resurrection without fully going through and understanding Calvary. You know, the cross is our primary symbol as Catholic Christians. And the reason that is our primary symbol is that it's not as much about Calvary as it is about resurrection. But it's an indicator that we're not going to get to hope, we're not going to get to resurrection without going through Calvary. And so sometimes, because we tend to, a lot of folks in ministry, a lot of parents, and this is good, I want to affirm this, this is good. You've got something I wish I could have more of in my life, which is optimism. It's hard to have been doing counseling for being a human trash can for the last 13 years and walk around being optimistic. I'm hopeful, I'm not always optimistic. Um, but, but understand that when we're, and we're going to talk about just a hair about listening um, and validating, understand that, that that positive message, that hopeful message that we have for young people, 
will fall on deaf ears if it is not preceded by a realistic acknowledgement of the Calvary and the, the cross that we're all having to carry and that we carry. You know, if you come to me and you start giving me this positive thinking stuff, as wonderful as that can be, I will tune you out. Teens will tune you out because it's not based in realism. And so my favorite definition of contemplative prayer today is one by Father John McNamara. And he said it's a long, loving look at the real. And so what does that mean? It means that when we go to young people, we go to listen to them and we go to be there for them. That, that one, that we acknowledge and validate that what we are going through, what they're going through, what we're all going through together is really rough. Um, and it's really tough. And, and it also means, and this is going to depend upon the age of the kid, it's always important that the kid gets as much information and as much truth as that child can handle. And so older teens are absorbing more content. They're going to be able to bear a little bit more. And to be able to say, yeah, we don't know when this is going to, we don't know how long it's going to take. Right now, I can do that in a couple of different ways. I can do it with tears in my eyes or I'm completely having a meltdown. And look, we may come to that. There are going to be people who are going to have to have those conversations with teens and you're going to have tears in your eyes um, because of someone who you know has contracted this virus and most likely because of someone you know who has fallen um, as a victim to the virus. And that's not panic. That's, that's realism, right? But we're not, and some of you may, have, may already be there. But if you're not, then we, we continue to maintain hope. But if you don't acknowledge the reality of the, the situation that we're in, both, both real and be real about it. Every day we're moving into an unknown, and that is incredibly destabilizing for the soul. Actually, it's good for the soul to have that tension, but it's destabilizing for the psyche. So if we don't acknowledge that, then when we try to offer them the hope, it's going to fall on deaf ears. That's, that's very, very, very important. Um, acknowledge the resilience of the young people. They're showing us right now how to be resilient. I will tell you that the two young people in my home right now are teaching me more about resilience than I have probably been able to teach them. Like, they're holding it together. Their whole the world is turned inside out. Um, they love routine, and routine has kind of gone out of the window, and we're making a makeshift of it. The clients that I'm able to work with are showing an incredible amount of resilience. Acknowledge that. This generation knows that we have kind of poo-pooed all over them in terms of being snowflakes and that they're non-resilient. Um, if you really acknowledge the gift and acknowledge the, um, the teaching moment that they're showing us, and that, that actually makes me emotional to say that. Um, so listen. Listen to them and just say, hey, do you want to talk? One of the gifts of this is that, you know, I've got time for conversations. Eighty percent of my clients have canceled in the next month and moved their sessions down the road, and I'm home. So, like, I just get to be dad therapist. Um, I get to be home. I get to listen. Um, and we get to do that. Um, we definitely want to offer encouragement and hope, even if you don't feel like it in the moment. Now, that's not being disingenuous, right? Being disingenuous and being manipulative, Right, there's a huge difference there. So even if I'm not feeling encouragement and I'm not feeling hopeful, if I'm when I'm trying to instill that into my child, that isn't being disingenuous. Some folks will roy, well that's being manipulative. Nope. Being manipulative is when I'm doing that for my own good. When I'm doing it for their good, right, that's called being a leader. That's positively influencing young people. Um as well as the neuroscience behind this, when we speak out negativity and we constantly are talking about these, um, these, these very worrisome things, which are, which are very real, when we speak that out, um, it activates in our brain right, like to a level, like to a, uh, exponentially. Now, I'm not saying that positive talk is necessarily going to fill you with wonderful feelings, but when we speak out loud, the negative, even the reality um, is, is, is as bad as it can be. And then what I'm really talking about is doing that over and over and over. That actually will flood our body with cortisol, which none of us need anymore of. Um, prayer, pray as you can, not as you can. And encourage your team to be able to do that. Pray as a family in ways that you can. And this doesn't need to be something that you do the same way at the same time every day. And, and that's valuable. That'll take me to my next point, which is, Get as much of a routine as you can, 
yet understand that the routine and the monotony are going to get old and that we've got to find creative ways for variety. And so, yeah, we're going to do the schedule, you know, as best we can this week. We're going to do the schedule as best we can, but we're also going to find ways to have some variety. And that's going to take real leadership by parents. It's going to take real leadership by adults who really, their own anxiety, and I'm speaking for me right now, their own anxiety just wants to be glued into media. I want every press conference right now. Um, and one of the reasons we're wanting that and we're addicted to the news cycle is that, especially for those of us who are complying with the stay at home, we feel like when, when we do get the more serious information, it validates um, it validates what we're doing, and that, that's not such a bad thing. But 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 understand that that it's going to take a leadership on our part to break away, as my son so accurately told me last night. Is that you've been on your phone for the past four hours straight, right? That was more than he's been on his phone in the last two days, um, which is pretty damn miraculous if you ask me. Um, and he's right. And so I've got to put the phone down. Yes, let's go out and build the garden in the shade, probably where the plants aren't going to grow. But we need to go out and dig up the soil because the damn tiller's broken. And so, yes, let's go do that. And we all feel better afterwards, even though we're going to plant some plants there that aren't ever going to thrive. Um, finally, exercise is probably the best antidepressant, anti-anxiety agent on the planet. Physical exercise. Exercise as you can. Not as you can. Go for walks. Keep the social distancing. Right. Do micro exercise sessions. And I subscribe to a lot of these online, and a lot of physical therapists are recommending this. I am not a physical therapist. Please consult your doctor before attempting any at home physical exercise. But a couple of push ups here and there, four or five times a day, is better than no push ups. Right. I'm going for a five minute walk an hour is better than going for one ten every hour of the day is better than going for one ten minute walk. So find ways to do things that you can. Find little things that you've got and help teens and young people identify things that they can control and that they have power over. Okay. And make a list of those things. You know, today I made a list, and I'll, I'll just kind of briefly read it to you, this little list that I made today um, called Silver Linings. And if you know me, you know that that's a phrase that makes me kind of want to puke in my mouth a little bit. There's a silver lining behind every cloud, right, which made no one feel better ever. But here's some silver linings around all of this for me. I get to slow down. been bitching for the last year and a half just that I don't have any time at home and how much I want to be home. I've got five months at home. <laughs> um, uh, there's less food because my wife is actually enforcing to stay at home, so we're, I'm not going to the grocery store every day. Although I will say that I am eating pork rinds and coffee right now in my good Cajun tradition. Um, my compassion fatigue, which had reached an all-time high, is actually starting to subside, and it's reminding me of something that I've said a long time ago, that even if I didn't need the money, and right now I do need the money, but I can't make the money, and I'm still counseling anyway. It's a good thing that I'm not loose on the street, because I'd be having counseling sessions on the sidewalk. Um, I'm getting more sleep. I'm getting more time with my family. I'm clarifying my priorities. I'm reminding myself. Um, of, of my own resilience. I grew up in poverty. Um, I'm not even, I'm not within a, a, a 85 zip code of poverty right now. Like, we can do it. I'm not sitting for eight hours a day, which has been killing my body and inflaming my knock knees. Um, I still have a few clients that haven't decided to punt their sessions down the road. I'm walking, thinking, I'm writing more. Um, I'm cooking more with my boys, which if you know anything about us Cajuns, like that is, that makes me kind of tear up. Um, and we planted a garden. It may or may not grow, but we're planting a garden anyway. So that's all I got, folks. I'd love to be able to help answer your questions. Um, in case I can't see what's going on right now, I'm just kind of looking into the background of my computer screen. And I just say I'm always anxious to know what, what's working for you, too. And even though I know we're doing questions now, please email me at Roy at today's teenager.com and I'd love to hear it. Also, we just finished a podcast series on helping teens through trauma. I didn't want to make this all about trauma, but at today's teenager podcast, those podcasts would be very, very helpful right now. Um, and they kind of get into some of the more detailed oriented stuff around trauma. So thank you so much. Thank you, Roy. Um, we really appreciate you making this work and sharing some of your wisdom and thoughts. What I wanted to do is open it up to questions from the audience. And so 
for any of you who uh, have already typed in questions uh, in the chat, that's a great way to share it. But you can also unmute yourself. We'll ask you to do that one at a time, please. And so um, if you are interested in asking the right question, go ahead and unmute yourself. And please introduce yourself, your name, and where you're from before you ask. Are people able to unmute themselves or do I need to go in and do that manually? Okay. I can unmute um, myself. One question, Roy, that was asked was, do you have any extra tips for yeah. seniors with graduation, proms, awards, um, all those people who are struggling with uh, the fact that they're not gonna be able to celebrate their senior year? Yeah. Um, one, I think just acknowledge the reality of that. Um, I think um, <clears throat> tips that we share with them is, is validate it, but we got to, what, what they need right now, and, and we're going to have plenty of, so one, give yourself permission to not just validate that for them now, but right now, perspective is going to be more important than anything. And so what happens, what I'm afraid of and what I'm seeing is that if we over empathize, I'm not saying we don't empathize and validate a little bit and say, I can't imagine how hard this is for you. It makes perfect sense to me that you wouldn't want to get out of bed in the morning because you really have had a great senior year so far and that just got flushed down the trash can. And we still got to be able to move on with life. Like now we get to focus on college. Now we've, we've got to focus on some other things. Understand that you're going to be able to validate this trauma for them over the next year to two years. That, that you're validating with that and treating and communicating with them around this issue right now um, is going to continue over the next couple of years. Like, it's a myth that I've got to be able to find the magic words or find the magic thing to do that's going to make the pain of this go away. We don't believe that. Like that's not our fundamental Christian Catholic anthropology. Um, and and this is an incredible life lesson for them. They may not get it. They may not understand what a life lesson this is for them. I didn't understand it when I was being unmercifully bullied in high school and when I was being abused and neglected. I didn't get it. But those times are things that I can reach back into my cookie jar and go, you know what, I made it through that. I can also make it through this. Finally, I would just add on that because this is a big question many folks have is find a way to commemorate this and memorialize this in and, and, and as many ways as you can. So what we focus on expands. That's a fundamental principle right there. What you focus on expands. If we focus on what we're not going to be able to do and what we can't control, then that will expand, and that is going to overwhelm us. But if we focus on what we can't, now acknowledge it, acknowledge it, and that's a key point, because if you don't and you rush over to the positive thinking side of it, that's not going to land and it's not going to work. But let's focus on what we can control. Can we do this? I and look, acknowledge it while you. I know that this isn't as good as graduating. I know it's not as good as having a graduation party. Also, find ways that you can, and be careful that you can. Don't make promises right now to these young people that you can't follow through on. But um, find ways to, if, and if you can, look to say, I don't know how we're going to do it but we're going to make it up to you. We're going to find a way to celebrate this, and we're going to find a way to do this. I don't know when, and I don't know how, but we're going to find a way to do it. Um, and if you can mean that, that, that'll mean a lot to them. Great. Thanks, Roy. Thank uh, I want to open, yeah, for sure, bro. I want to open it up to some other questions from the group. So if you have a question um, and you're not able to mute yourself, just send me a note in the chat, and I will unmute you so you can ask your question. Roy, I know a number of people, uh, we shared your website um, and there's some information that is up on your website right now. Anything that you would find particularly helpful for parents at this moment? Yeah, I, uh, on my website, you mean? Yeah, on your website and specifically, uh, RoyCutterfields.com. Yeah, I think the podcast, you know, the podcast is probably the most valuable thing on the website. Um, we just did a series on, on trauma. Um, I think that, 
Uh, and we're still kind of inventing it as we go here. Uh, and there's going to be a lot more content to come. I think that the one on trauma, all of the podcasts on listening. Um, I, I, I think, I think here's, here's one I think that parents need to hear. And this is one that, that, and I'm privileged to have been able to consult with a lot of school districts, a lot of superintendents and principals, which is to say, this is unprecedented. I'm only 46. You know, this is, un- my mother-in-law is, is 70 something years old. I don't want to say how old it is because I may not get a Christmas present if I, if I go overboard, but um, this is unprecedented. And so I have noticed, I have noticed that there is this real frenetic energy around making sure that school still happens. And the grand scheme of things, school's not going to happen the way it would have happened in these brick and mortar schools. And let's just all take a chill pill. Like I really wish we had taken a week off in some places um, and lower your expectations for the teachers, right? My wife's been an online virtual teacher for 10 years. It's laughable. And and a brick and mortar, and she was a brick and mortar teacher before. It's laughable that a lot of brick and mortar teachers are being expected to overnight become a virtual teacher. That is an that is an incredibly sophisticated skill set. And now we're expecting kids who some of whom already have executive functioning issues to become proficient online learning. They had a hard enough time doing it with a constant reminder and the teacher's prefrontal cortex in the front of the classroom. They're going to really struggle now. I'm all about, I'm never, I'm never about turning young people into a bunch of Kleenex hugging little couch sniffing victims. That is not my MO. At the same time, I'm going to say lower your expectations for your kids right now academically. Mm-hmm. Teachers, lower your expectations for yourselves. Administrators, lower your expectations. Parents, lower your expectations, right? And to realistic levels, not to throw them out of the window, but to lower them to some, some realistic levels. Um, and let's just all take a chill pill. Otherwise, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss a, what could be, for many, a real grace-filled time to connect. Yes, do your schoolwork. But those perfectionistic kids, um, they're never going to be able to do it as well as they want to do it right now. And we've got to give them permission for that to be okay. Everyone's in it together. Uh, Roy, we had uh, two questions that were pretty similar from Louisa and Jennifer. Um, what advice do you give for teens, working with teens who we know are in troubled households right now? Um, but also, yeah. what advice do you give for parents who are working with teens who may be suffering from addictions or having issues under their roof, um, especially now that everybody's yeah. on top of each other? What, what can you say about that? Yeah. Two questions. So let me address the addiction one first, because that's a that's a key component. And and one, you know, a lot of um, a lot of I, I a lot of my clients, a lot of them deal with first world problems, right? Their first world problems. About twenty percent of my clients actually absolutely need my services. About eighty. Now that's not true for every therapist, but but for those where there's addictions in place understand that that's a real mental health issue and it's often it's often a cluster of mental health issues and the addiction right very often is medicating the mental health issue and so understand that telecounseling and telehealth platforms um, have never been less expensive i know we have drastically reduced our rates and even i can't i'm this isn't a commercial because i can't see people outside of louisiana but a lot of counselors there there's a lot of online telehealth platforms so that applies to both, to, for the teens to be able to find resources for themselves. And look, it's not ideal. I, I, I as a therapist, I'll tell you, I don't hate it, but because I really do enjoy it for a few of my clients. But it's awkward as hell for a lot of them. But it's still better than nothing, right? And so, one, don't ignore that, right? This, understand that for when addictions in play under the roof, whether it's a parent, an uncle living in there, or with the teen, that this is going to be a time when their drug of choice, whatever that is, is going to be especially appealing to them. And so helping them find ways to stay sober, assuming that they, they've ever been sober, and, and helping to support them you know, in, those, um, in those ways. In terms of the abuse issue, um, that's so funny, that, because ironically, because my wife and I, we were just sitting down this morning having coffee, and, and through tears, she just said, you know, I find myself complaining um, 
you know, and we both are. I mean, no one's complaining more than I am in my head. Um, I give a voice to it every once in a while, and she's just like, what about all these kids for whom school was the only safe place they had? Um, and um, it just breaks my heart um, for them. And, and so now they don't get that escape. And so now these young people are having to do things that honestly most adults don't know how to do, which is practice an extreme version of mental toughness. What I would tell those young people is to go get David Goggins' book or listen to it on Audible or watch his YouTube videos, someone who was in that type of a situation and made it out. What they need now is hope. How do, how do, what can you control? How do you protect yourself? What are some safe ways for you to set boundaries that don't inflame the abuse, that don't make the situation worse? How, how do, what's the realistic goal here? I'm not going to change the system if I'm a young person in an abusive household most of the time. How do I outlast the system? And so as a therapeutic goal, sometimes it's keeping this kid alive until they can get out of the house. Um, and so hang in there. Find ways to hope. Find Hope Hope is a virtue. And all virtues aren't just pring, little Harry Potter magic wands. They're things that come as a result of practicing it. Right? You Hope. Without having to practice it, hope is not a virtue. It's just about being naive, right? It's being naive. And so courage and hope are virtues that we practice in the midst of a despairing, challenging situation. You can't become resilient when you've had nothing to become resilient to. Um, and so, all right, that's it. Enough of my little van down by the <laughs> river. Tough talk. No, no problem, Roy. Roy, can you repeat the name of the author that you were talking about? Yeah, David Goggins. The name of the book is You Can't Hurt Me. Um, and I'll just preface it for all the people out there. And probably if you're logging on to this, that you probably expected a couple of curse words because you know me. Um, but, but, but it's fairly liberal in its use of, of um, some, some choice language. But he was basically a young black male um, who grew up in, in, in Indiana and, and survived abuse and went on to become a Navy SEAL and has run um, some of the toughest uh, long distance ultra marathons in the world. Um, I will just tell you that so many of my clients have found so much inspiration in it, it made me go look him up. Um, and um, it's, you know, when you've got a kid who's in a really bad abusive situation, an author who drops the F-bomb here and there, that's not my biggest concern. <laughs> so again, that's pedophies, right? I'm not saying that's gospel. Um, but it's kind of piece. And I will say that some of my kids that I've worked with who are in an abusive environment have found it incredibly hopeful and motivating and inspiring. Yeah. We had a great question from Stephanie who asked, how do we help young people who maybe don't know how or don't have the skills to verbalize what's happening inside of them? How can we help or approach them, particularly yeah, parents, great. give them space to share that? Great question. Um, and that's true for most young people, right? Because as Dr. McCarty often used to remind us, and may, maybe still does to some of you who see him more than I do, that they're experience rich and language poor. So one of our challenges is, is how do we help young people articulate that inner experience, not only of God, of spirituality, of faith, um, of success, of optimism, of hope, but also of, of the troubles right now. And so, so some of what we can do is, we can anticipate, right, and this is where our experience, especially as youth ministers, comes in. You know, when you've worked with thousands and thousands and thousands of young people in situations that are similar, maybe not have been quite as rough as they are now, so I can tell you what some of those experiences are almost with um, unanimously. One is confusion. Um, one is fear, but understand that a lot of kids, fear is a very vulnerable emotion. Another is uncertainty, a lack of predictability. Um, they're watching a lot of adults freak out. They're watching, um, they've already grown up in a, in, a, in a very, in a period of great civil unrest um, in political, racial, you know, all sorts of, uh, not that those, that's not a political issue, but, um, um, and so those, those feelings are getting amplified. And so when we can name it, we can tame it. That, not saying we can fix it, but I can tame it, 
right? It doesn't have to have control over me because the worst part of it is I've got all these feelings and I, I just don't know what they are. And I'll tell you just some, I, you don't have enough minutes left on this call for me to articulate some of the, I keep going back and forth between sad and mad. They're two sides of the same coin. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and those seniors that we talked about earlier, they're going to get to mad at, at some point. They need to get to mad and they have every right to be pissed. They have every right to be mad. That, that, and, and yet yeah, we've been prepping them for this our whole life. When, and that's why we've never sold them a bill of goods. Life's not fair. I've been telling you that since day three. It's not fair. Yes, this is not fair. You have every right to be upset about it. Um, I, I, this is a question we ask our clients all the time who are in those situations. If you had a magic wand, how would you change things? And give that person the opportunity to be able to say these beautiful words, which is, I just wish I could make it all go away. I just wish I could make it all go away. And look, folks, we're not even in the thick of it yet. We're still on the beginning edge of this. Like, we're going to, so prep yourself for your own emotional um, and understand how big of an effect that that's going to have on kids, right? Um, I I am watching enough to know that this is going to get really, really, really bad, and especially in a lot of these urban areas. Um, and um, right now, if I had a magic wand, I just wish I could make it all go away. Um, I, 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 I lived in Italy for two years. I was um, I benefited from the hospital system and the medical system when I was there. Um, and to watch it capitulate right now um, is, is um, it's tough. Um, and so those are just a, you know, just a few observations there. Um, Roy, we got time for two more questions. I'm going to ask you the first awesome. one so that you have some time to think about it. And then I'll ask you the second okay. one. The first question Thank was, uh, since we all have some newfound uh, free time, uh, any other book recommendations or uh, recommendations on uh, videos that we might be able to watch, a TED Talk? Um, the, the second question, what I'll ask you to answer first, do you have any tips for parents who are essential workers, those who are leaving their teams at home while they have to go to work, uh, maybe in some yeah. cases deal with really challenging and difficult situations, healthcare workers, police officers, firefighters, any suggestions for that? Yeah, um, and and I would also add some counselors and psychiatrists to that mix, like um, especially psychiatrists who also have to go into hospitals as, as well. And a lot of we're considered essential personnel as well. Now we can do a lot of it via telehealth, um, but but so like friends of mine who are physicians who are in the hospital who are on in on, not only on the front lines but they're in the trenches right getting shot at right now. Um, what do I tell my kid? Um, Depends on the age of the kid. Um, so a friend of mine I know told his kids to understand. I mean, this is what he told his kids. He was like, look, and, and he follows the principle that I say, which is to be real. Look, we're all going to know someone who's affected by this. We're all going to know somebody who's, who's going to die from this. Dad's a doctor, um, and I may not, um, you know, I may get it. I'll, I'll, there's a great likelihood that I will get it. Um, we'll hope that I'm going to be okay. Um, everything is set up for you. Um, so yeah, now the other piece I think is also important, and what I would add to that, I don't know if he did or not, which is to say, but I'm hopeful, right? I, I don't believe that, I don't necessarily, I believe that science is real, uh, but this is something that I've got to do. And give your this gives your kid an opportunity to be proud of you. That's a big deal. Gives your kid an opportunity to be proud of you. And and, and they're going to worry. Look, look, look. And, and here's the, this is going to give us all perspective on our first world anxiety problem that we had a year and a half ago for many of us. Oh, oh, oh I'm not going to get into Harvard. <laughs> oh, you're not going to get into Harvard? Absolutely, you're freaking concerned right now, buttercup. <laughs> right? And so, and so it's a, um, you know, to be able to say, like, yes, like, this is something that's worth worrying about. And I've got context for all the other BS, the bull, that's half a word in Louisiana. Um, now I've got context for the rest of that. Um, to be able to, and now, for younger kids, we just always want to give them as much hope as possible. I think it's important for parents not to have a meltdown in front.
front of their kids. To be real offers as much reality as necessary for them to be able to hook on to the hope. Mm-hmm. I want to say that again. Give them as much reality as necessary, not more, not less, in order for them to be able to hook on and latch on to the hope um, and the encouragement that we're giving them. Mm-hmm. Um, um, you're a hero, right? Um, you're a hero. That's, that's what those parents are. And as youth ministers, we need to communicate that to our young people, that these are heroes. These are, these are heroes who are no less heroes than the ones who went into the wreckage after 9-11. No less heroes than the one who, who saved the, the passengers on the airplane when I think he flew it into the Potomac, right? Um, the, the, the forest fighters, right? And, and this, this is what, what heroism, this is what courage looks like. Um, and um, I just think that, that that can be really, really affirming. Um, be assured of our prayers for you. Ask for help. This is the other thing that I would say if you're on the front lines and for those parents who are listening who are in the essential personnel. Ask for help. Trust me when I tell you my doctor texted, put on Facebook the other day, hey, we're completely out of Clorox wipes. Um, if you have any left over, could you bring them? I was like, absolutely, freaking lutely. I rushed over there, dropped them at the door, didn't want to go in. And she was like, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was like, don't thank me. That made me feel good. That gave me a sense of control over a powerless situation. You didn't impose on me. You gave me an opportunity to get my ass out of the house. Thank you for that. Thank you for risking the humility and the vulnerability to ask. It takes much more courage to ask for help than it does to reach out and help. And so ask for help and let, let your community of faith you know, support you in that. In terms of, um, in terms of TED Talks and addition, I think, to the Goggins one, um, maybe we can send some of these out in an email. I, have, um, I know Ave Marie Press, my publisher, is discounting a lot of their e-books. Um, I know my book, I, I think my TED Talk is, is decent, um, and young people in these situations are much more bullish on David Goggins. I like the work of, of Jocko Willink, um, The Way of the Warrior Kid. Basically what we're looking for, for for young people right now, in addition to spiritual tools and these other things, are, are inspiration. Who are the... Right, right. Hope has always been in a person. That's why we don't have an idea nailed to a cross. It's a person, right? And, and, and we often talk about testimony, 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 testimony. Right now, people are looking for testimonies. Yeah. I want to see someone who has made it through something that I consider to be unmanageable, and yet they have made it through, because if they can do it, then maybe I can do it as well. And so we want to look for that in a whole host of ways. Um, exercise, helping young people realize what exercise does to the brain, what prayer does to the brain, um, breathing techniques. These are all really powerful. Um, anyway, um, a lot of that, is, but I'll have to get back to you on that because none are like coming to mind right now, Darius. No, that's okay, Roy. Thank you so much. Um, we were out of time. And so I want to just thank you personally from all of us here at NFCYN for being such a good friend. Uh, and for continuing to support the field during these really difficult times. Um, We will be following up with everyone with an email, which will include the recording to this session if you want to share with anybody who wasn't able to join us. Um, I'd also like to invite you um, to share with any of your colleagues and your parents um, the information for our next webinar, which is on Thursday. Uh, It'll be at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, uh, with our friend Gabriel Uh, Gabriela Silva from the Fuller Institute. Um, That conversation will be very similar, just talking about some of the best uh, perspectives from another mental health specialist who uh, works specifically with youth. Uh, Roy and Gabriela were a part of a panel uh, at our membership meeting this past year that was wonderful uh, and really shined a light on a lot of things. And so we're hoping that this will just be continued opportunities for conversation. Um, If you had any other questions that weren't answered, I also added Uh, Roy's website information into the chat box. Make sure to download that before you go. If you're open the chat box, um, if you click on the the ellipses, the three uh, dots next to the file section, you can actually um, save the chat and you'll have access to all of that information in your own group text. Um, But Roy, thank you again. It's always a pleasure and always a gift to hear you. Thank you guys. 
Um, we thank all of you and continue to pray for each of you during this difficult and challenging time. Um, we say just a prayer of thanksgiving and ask our Father to be with us uh, in the midst of all of this, um, and especially be with all of those who are struggling with mental health issues, uh, with all our teenagers who are struggling with stress and difficulties, and all the parents who are doing this work, as we pray those words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. St. John Paul II, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all again for joining us. Have a wonderful day, and God bless.